yeah, the uh, the funeral side is what I always wanted to do, but the business is really what I'm called to do. I asked myself this one question, what is stopping me from doing this? Welcome to the Zero to Profitable Franchise Podcast, the best place for you to come to figure out the right franchise to buy and how to get and stay profitable. My name is Tark Johnson, and I've bought, grown, and sold multiple franchises and got myself free from corporate America, and now I'm on a mission to help you do that too. Here you'll find some of the most in-depth, profitable franchise secrets, tangible strategies, and specific mindsets to help you create your dream life through franchising. All right, so this episode is for those of you who could use a little inspiration. So I talked to Dallas Curry, who's a Jets pizza franchisee. And his story is anything but traditional. At the age of five years old, he knew with certainty that he wanted to be a mortician. Yes, I said that right, a mortician. He set out his life path on doing just that. And later on, he was being mentored by a funeral director and he realized that this was not the path for him and felt pulled towards entrepreneurship. So after starting a few businesses with his brother, He had this dream and idea to create a holding company that bought businesses. And in a story of crazy twists and turns, obstacles, the business broker who was selling the business wound up going out of business and he eventually managed to stumble to the finish line and acquire a Jets Pizza franchise, an existing location. This is the story of vision, resilience, and an unstoppable belief in himself. We discuss how he funded his business, how he negotiated the purchase of the resale franchise, almost got turned down for the lease, and what it's like being a franchisee. It just shows you that if you truly put your mind to your goal and commit to even the toughest of circumstances cannot stop you. Now this episode is not sponsored by anyone, so if you're wanting to buy a franchise in the next 12 months, you should check out my free franchise masterclass at buyaprofitablefranchise.com. And if you want to work with me and my team on finding or buying a franchise or resale business, then you can go to tarikjohnson.com slash consulting, and we're happy to see if we can help. With that said, let's jump into episode number six of the Zero to Profitable Franchise Podcast. Cool. All right, everyone. I am here with Mr. Dallas Curry. Dallas Curry is a uh, a franchisee with a company called Jets Pizza, and we wind up connecting... And he was telling me his story and like my jaw dropped. And I think we, that first meeting, you were just telling me the story for an entire 30, 40 minutes. And yeah, like yeah. it was, you had me on the edge of my seat. So <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, happy to have you. Welcome. Welcome here. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be here. It's an honor to be on your podcast uh, this morning. And, and I'm excited. I'm excited. Yes, awesome. Sir. Likewise, me too. <laughs> Well, cool. Let's just start off and um, just tell everyone a little bit about kind of what your, you know, your background is in terms of work, career, business, stuff like that. And, and how did you wind up getting interested in pursuing buying a franchise? Okay. All right. Yeah. So my name is Dallas Curry. I'm 30 years old. Uh, so I started my entrepreneurial journey when I was 19. I was thinking about that the other day. I started when I was 19 my entrepreneurship journey. Uh, I, I originally went to school, to college, to be a funeral director, to be a funeral director. And I, uh, after going through school and getting out of school and getting in the business of working the funeral home and understanding how the business worked, I realized my passion really was to be an entrepreneur, not necessarily work in the funeral home industry. So I started uh, digging deeper into entrepreneurship, like really starting to go to some SBA uh, meetings, uh, to like free webinars, free free workshops and meetings to learn about how to start a business, what should I do? And so I started digging deeper into that. And then uh, some years went by after working in the funeral business and, and the owner of that particular funeral home I worked for, she took me under her wings and began to teach me the business side. And to share knowledge about business and 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 also show examples and, and, and scenarios and also allowed me to be a part of certain situations in the business that grew my mind and understanding in business. And so after doing that uh, and realizing what 
what I really wanted to do, I uh, it was a scroll at first because all through my elementary school years, kindergarten years, starting at kindergarten, I used to draw in my drawing journal. In kindergarten, you have a drawing journal. You know, I don't know if they still do it or not, but uh, I had a drawing journal that I would draw funeral processions in my drawing journal, like caskets, uh, uh, limos, and all that kind of thing. And that, so that is cr- <laughs> that's crazy. You were in, you're in yeah. elementary school? No, no, kindergarten. In kindergarten, kindergarten. Doing that. Yeah, and so Somebody, my mom did, and dad did, did, did they think you had an issue? I mean, that seems like uh, a morbid yeah. kind of thing for a kindergartner to be. <laughs> they did, they did, they did, and, and and my mom had a they had a parent teacher conference. My my mom and dad did, and so with my my kindergarten teacher, and they said my my first name is Randy. I prefer to go by Dallas. So they said, uh, let me show you what Randy is drawing in his journal. They said he. I, it is so, has someone passed in your family recently that he's having a hard time adjusting to it? And my mom said, oh, no, no, no. He wants to be a mortician. And so, <laughs> and so, <laughs> and as a matter of fact, she found my journal at home years later. She found it. And I put it in my closet at my, at my home in uh, South Carolina. It's still there. It's still there in the closet, in the top of the closet. I want to keep it. And so, uh, so it, I started, I, so all through my grade school years, whenever, you know, people would ask, our teachers would ask the students, what should people even grow up? I would always say a martician. And so when I graduated from uh, from, from high school, I, I was already accepted into a mortuary college. I was already ready to go and to move. So I moved four hours away. And then to get to mortuary school, school and realize that there's another tug, another pull to do something different. It was very challenging at first to really uh, you know, understand that and th- didn't know why, because I felt like I was gonna be a failure if I did not do what I said I was gonna do. So I, it took me a while through prayer, through counsel, I began to really understand entrepreneurship and really knew, know that, yeah, the, uh, the funeral side is what I always wanted to do, but the business is really what I'm called to do. And so, mm-hmm. so I, let's, I, I, let, I, let's unpack that for a second, because I think that's a okay. really, really powerful point. And, and for those who are listening or watching right now, uh, they can probably relate uh, a lot where they may be in a job that they thought they were going to do for a while. They may have a different business that they thought they were going to do or pursuing a path that they've invested so much time and energy and they feel nervous to just pivot and go differently. Mm -hmm. So what was that like as you were in the school going through that program four hours away, you've been thinking about doing this since kindergarten. So for over a decade. So what was that inner tug like and how were you able to come out the other side and figure out that, all right, I'm going to pursue my entrepreneurial dreams. Yeah. Yeah. So the tug was really hard. I mean, like I, you know, I will go home like some uh, individuals who work their their nine to five job will go home and be like, man, I know it's more, and man, I know I want to spend more time in my side business. I want to make it my full-time business. And what I would do, I would go home and I would keep saying, I know that I, I want to do funeral service, but I, it's something about business that keep pulling me, keep pulling me. And one, I kept like praying about it, kept praying about it, like for direction, for direction, for direction. And one Sunday I was in our church service on a Sunday and my pastors uh, had called me out and they were like, uh, you know, they gave, gave me a word uh, to, to, to let me know that entrepreneurship is where I'm supposed to be. And when they told me that they, I, at the time, they didn't know or wasn't aware of what I was dealing with internally. And so for me, Sunday mornings are being like, like I'm, 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 a, I'm I live here in Georgia where I'm a Christian here. I, anyway, I'm a Christian, but I, <laughs> I, I, I live, my church here in Georgia, what I'm trying to say, my church here in Georgia, that's not a part of, uh, they didn't have a, a, no idea that I was having that particular uh, tug, a war inside of me about trying to decide what 
career path to take. And when they gave me that instruction that God said, I am an entrepreneur and that I, I, I will you know, own businesses, I would teach entrepreneurship. And when they said that, it just unleashed and released me from that tug of war. Mm. And I knew, and then things began to happen. And so I, I, at that time, it was, I think it was the end of the year, or going to the beginning of the new year, because we're like on this fast, you know, a lot, a lot of uh, different religions does fast at the beginning of the year. Uh, as Christians, we do one like for 21 days. And so at that particular time, our pastor had told us to go on a fast for 21 days and to really ask God to show your gift while you are on this fast, like reveal your gift, like show me your, like show, ask God to show you your gift, for your, your gift, the gift that he placed inside of you. And I did that. I did that. And my brother as well, because he, now he's going to come into the picture of this part of my journey. And so we did that. And I began to uh, really, I had this idea of a nonprofit. That's how it started as a nonprofit. And I began to work on the nonprofit. So your, so your first entrepreneurial idea was to start a nonprofit. Is that yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. That was the first entrepreneurial idea to start a nonprofit. And while in the process of 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 of, of identifying what we were going to do, what service, how it was going to cater to the community, my brother is a creative. He's creative. So he's he he designs jewelry, he's a he's a wardrobe stylist. And he, at the time, we can remember, we both on a 21-day fast uh, praying about our gifts. And he began to realize, he remembered how he would make jewelry with my mom. My mom would buy jewelry from, like, different department stores. And sometimes she shop off the clearance right. So sometimes she would, it won't have the earrings to go with it. So she would buy two of the same necklaces. And she would, she would break them apart, and she would make the earrings to match the necklace. And so my brother remembered as a young his journey, it, you know, it was, he would help, he would like make or make it. So he began to make handcrafted jewelry. And so what I realized then, I need to marry the business side to his creative side because he's creative, but he didn't, he didn't understand business. So mm -hmm. we say, you know what? Let's create this business called D-Ray Mott Collection. Let's create this business. I will handle all the business stuff and you would just do the design. Now, now, okay, so let's pause there for a second. So uh -huh. that, I mean, fascinating to me, like true entrepreneur, right? Like seeing the opportunity yeah. and the need, right? I mean, yeah. entrepreneurship yeah. is about solving, solving problems and a need. So how were you gaining this confidence around entrepreneurship? Mm. Were you reading books? Were you listening to stuff? Like, I mean, before that, you were studying to become a mortician. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so how, yeah. how were you finding this confidence in, outside of, you know, from the church? Like, how yeah. are you actually building that skill set at that time? It, it, um, it was, it came from the church originally. They released me to it. But I started looking into SBA uh, programs. Mm, the SBA, okay. it was a free, it was free uh, resources. Uh, I and think SBA the, uh, stands for Small Business Administration, small business everyone administration. watching that. That's right. And they have a SCORE program. I think it's called SCORE. Is that yep. uh, there? Yeah. And that particular program have a lot of different workshops. That's majority of them are free for entrepreneurs. And I begin to like intentionally schedule one a month. And I will go, since I live in Atlanta, the SBA office is in downtown Atlanta. So I will go to the office, to their workshops, sit in there. Sometimes I will go to the same one twice. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I didn't have no clue of what he was talking about. But just being in the atmosphere and, and taking steps, because I believed and, I, and I, I just receive and believe that I'm called to be an entrepreneur. So I was beginning to educate myself and also reading uh, different things on the SBA website. You know, the, I realized in my early stage of entrepreneurship, the, the SBA was a big sort of resource for me, along with having individuals that had that saw the potential in us and that poor that was already business owners. Like I, I mentioned to about the funeral home owner who's already a business owner 
at that time for seven years. So she saw the potential in me. So she was pouring in me. Then then I we'll meet someone else somewhere else. And and they'll be like, like, like uh like after we started doing jewelry, my brother started working I uh, started selling it in a local boutique in Atlanta. And a customer came in there, she loved the jewelry and she had a business a consulting business. And then she started pouring into us. She started giving us information and resources and said, hey, are you all incorporated? At the time, we wasn't, we incorporated, but I incorporated in, uh, not proper, not, not not the proper way. And so she began to like show us things like how to do that. So that's, those things, those are the things I was doing during that time to really, you know, bring bring it up like, like really uh grow my entrepreneurship knowledge about business and all and those type of things so uh yeah and i i, I just want to take a second and unpack that i mean it's it's so so key and you know what i'm hearing is you put yourself in the environment uh to learn the skills uh, mm-hmm. of what it takes to build a business and become an entrepreneur yeah. so it wasn't just like oh well, God told me that I should go this route and <laughs> yeah. now I'm just going to lay back and let him do his thing. Like you no. proactively went out yes. there to pursue that and to learn about that. And so that's really key for anyone watching. You know, one of the one of the phrases that I say often is knowledge is not power. Applied knowledge is, knowledge power. is power. That's and, right. That's and, right. And at the end of the day, you got to go out there and take the knowledge, which you were doing, going to those SBA classes, and then you started to apply it by going, oh, let me start this jewelry business with my brother. Um, And so you were actually applying it and implementing it. And then lo and behold, when you take action and you apply it, all of a sudden, the resources and help that you need comes to you. Yes. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And, and at the time, and, and my, my brother was actually working for Nordstrom and he was working for Nordstrom and I was working in the funeral home industry at a funeral home. And my brother had got fired from his job and at, we all, both of uh, him and I was roommates. And so he, he did, my mom had called one day, and I was home and she knew my brother should be at work at that particular time. So she called and she was like, hey, you know, I was know, having conversations and she said, there you so? I was like, yeah, you know, he's home. But I, I wasn't telling her. And she was like, oh, I got this email from the department stores. It was in my spam. She said, and they said they're looking for Southern designers that live in the Southern footprints, like Southern states. And uh, she said, I'm going to send it over to y'all. And Dallas, look into it and see if, something, if y'all can apply for it. So I said, okay. The, the, the application was easy as one, two, three. And I went and applied to that, to apply, I applied to it. Now, mind you, I, I, I have been going to SBA meetings and doing those different things. And one of the things that I, I was working on and getting the LLC established, getting us like a legit business, LLC and a business bank account, getting those things established. So I was in the process of, st- of working on that as well. It doesn't take long, but I was on the process. I mean, I'm learning. So I was in the process of setting it up. So when she sent it to me, they asked for our LLC information. And so I, I we did that. And we also did a, a product photo shoot. So we did a product photo shoot, attach all these pictures to uh, the application, sent it in. And it was 300 people that applied to this competition, okay? 300 applied. And they narrowed it down to about, God, I can't remember. It was, it was, they narrowed it down, I want to say probably about 80 people or so or less than that. And with, with, with the number they narrowed it down to, they wanted those individuals to come and do a 10 minute presentation on in front of a panel of buyers for belt department stores. Ooh. Now remember, <laughs> we we are young guys. We're young guys. At that time, uh we, we could had to be probably I said 19, but I want to say I had to be either 17 or 18 at that time. We were young. 
No, no, we, we were 19. We were 19. Yes, we were. I was 19. He was 18 because he's a year younger than me. So he was 18. I was 19. And so uh, we, so don't let, I mean, I applied. We get the email. We were part of the finalist group. We get the email. We part of the finalist. We got to go now to Charlotte, North Carolina to do our 10 minute presentation to talk about why our jury should be sold in bed department stores. So I hear go me, I go back to prayer. Like, okay, God, you got to give me a winning strategy. You got to give me a winning strategy. You got to give me a winning strategy. <laughs> I just kept saying, I, every morning I'm like, a winning strategy, winning strategy. And I, I, I did the, I started praying about a winning strategy. So this, something is, this idea came in my head to create this line called Be Inspired by D. Ray Mott. And it's D dot R-A-M-O-N-T. So it's D. Ray Mott. D Raymond, period, D Raymond. So I went and started doing research about being inspired by D Raymond. Like, wh- what does that mean? What does that, uh, what is it? And so what came to me was create jury, individual pieces of, of jury. Well, I didn't create them, my brother created them and named them inspirational names and find the color stone or colors that represent those inspirational names and then name the jury pieces those names. And so we did that. And I did a 10-minute presentation. And I did my research about Belk, about how it was founded by two brothers and how their how 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 they how their sons now run the company, was they don't run anymore, but was running that company. And I, I put all that into my presentation. And don't you know we won? We was one of the third, one of the 20, 20 people that won that competition. Wow. And my my brother was the only guy in the competition that won that year. And so I drew was sold in about, oh God, this was in 2000 and oh, 2000 and not 18, I think 13. Yeah. 2013, I think this happened. And we we sold in, we had how many stores we had? We had we had South Carolina, we had uh, Charlotte, we had uh Birmingham, Alabama. We had four stores, four stores across the US and uh online, customer about online. So we had to make over 117 pieces of jewelry. And remember, this is by hand. So I had to do all I had to do all the paperwork. I didn't I didn't touch anything. I had to do all the paperwork, setting up the SKUs, the SKUs and getting everything set up to go to retail. To go to retail. I mean, and I worked at that time I was working on UPS as a loader in the back of a truck, loading trucks. So I was working on UPS and I would come home and I, I would work doing because my UPS job was in the evening time, it was nighttime. So the morning time I would work on the business. Night time, I would work, you know, on the uh, work at UPS. So after a couple of years of like three years there, uh, I realized that the jewelry business can replace what I was making at UPS. And doing after we, I left after three years, I left UPS, started working in the jewelry business full time. We created a uh, showroom uh, here in Atlanta where we made the jewelry. And we also had it on display so customers and our retailers could come place orders or we would bring new designs to them. We uh, they had a booth at the America's Mart, which is like a big um, place where business buyers go that that are that have retail stores buy uh, items like jewelry, clothes, you know, shoes, that type of thing. We did a booth there uh, to so get more retailers. This is, I mean, this is amazing to me. So you were... 19 years old and yeah. had the wits and the skill set to say, all right, I need, I need a winning strategy. So you yes. asked, and th- this yep. is where there's so many powerful points that are duplicatable in a sense, because someone might hear it and they're like, man, he was just, you know, he was praying and you can't really duplicate <laughs> that. But here's what you can duplicate. If you ask yourself mm-hmm. a question, your brain will come up with the answer. The yep. question is, are you tuned in like a radio to the, yes. the right wavelength to receive yes. the answer to that question? And then when you get the answer to that question, so you said, all right, question, 
I need a winning strategy, right? Yeah. And then yeah. boom, idea pops in your head. So now you yep. get the idea. Then you took action on the idea. Yes. Like you yes. had belief yes. enough to take action on the idea. And so that's, right. that, that's just insane to me that at 19 years old, you were pitching uh, department stores to sell your jewelry in there. I mean, absolutely amazing. And what yes. an amazing story. Now let's, let's fast forward. Uh -huh. So let's fast forward until how in the world did you wind up becoming a franchisee for Jets and take us to the beginning of that story? Where did you get the idea to say, I want to own a franchise? Well, well, the franchise idea has always been there, even with the jury, even through doing research. And I would see different information about franchise and I would, I would read, I'm like, oh, yeah, I want to do something like that. And then I would try, I tried to create a company that has something like a licensing, like franchise model. And, but I, I, I didn't do all the due diligence part to really bring that forward. And I can see now why, why that didn't happen that way. But I always researched, like I looked into Little Caesars and like, again, the, the important thing too is, is that the lady from the funeral home and I, we will always talk about franchises. I talk about different types of businesses and I will look into like, 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 Little Caesars uh, was one of the things. I don't know if you, if it, I'm sure the listeners have. Little Caesars used to have on their boxes. I don't know if they still do because now I don't, I don't go there. I have a whole piece of place. <laughs> so so uh, they used to have on their boxes where you could actually get information about the franchise, about being a franchisee. And so I remember I looked into that and then I looked into a uh, carpet cleaning franchise. I, I They sent me over the package for, for, for me to... Uh, to like learn more about the company and to fast forward to what made me make this decision of jumping into it was this. I asked myself this one question, what's stopping me? What is stopping me from doing this? Like I really sat with that, like what's stopping me from acquiring this business or what's stopping me from moving into this franchise or really jumping in. And when I realized, Nothing was stopping me. I just needed to, like you mentioned a, a, a few moments ago, that the resource start coming. So when I made the decision to do it and to say to myself, what stopped me to answer myself back and said, nothing is stopping you, the resources started coming. I had a conversation with my mom and my brother together, and I said, hey, we got to get this franchise or we got to buy this particular business, which was a French, which is a franchise. And we had a meeting. I typed, the, I did all the due diligence, all the work due diligence, part of this, uh, what I'm saying when I say due diligence, the research of what type of franchise it is, how much it is, uh, it costs to get into it or to acquire this particular store. And I had a meeting with them, a meeting before dinner, because I want us to meet first and eat and make us happy if they, if they didn't go good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I said before before we eat, let's let's have this meet. <laughs> so I typed up this this paper. I still have it. Typed this paper up, and I I went down the list. And my mom is the person who was going to be the financer of it. So I needed the finances to get it going. But I had the idea. But I needed finances. So I went to her. I said, "This is what it's going to be. This is what I know so far." This is what I have gotten already from the broker and uh, from the broker at that time. And she said, OK, she said, well, go to the next step. And I said, go to the next step. So that I was I was so excited. I couldn't even enjoy my dinner because I was too excited. I was too excited. And so I went to the next step and oh, we started. Oh, hold on. So let's okay. let's pause. There. Uh, let's pause there for a second. So one, just to clarify, you bought an existing location. Right. Yes. You bought yes. an existing location, um, mm -hmm. which uh, which is amazing. And the fact that you went through that entire process, because sometimes an existing location can be a little bit more complex uh, because you're yep. dealing with negotiating and the purchase agreement. And you don't necessarily have someone hand holding you through the process, whereas you might if you're getting a new location. 
It's something yep. that uh, I have a few clients that uh, that I've worked with and helped them buy existing locations, and mm -hmm. um, it's it's been uh, it's been a fun fun process. But you said a really important point there, which is, you know, for for if for those of you who are watching or listening right now, sometimes you think you have to have all the answers, and so because you don't have all the answers or have all the steps figured out, you're not taking action and you're not doing anything and moving on to the next step. The reality is once you make a decision, once you decide, and once you tar start taking action and steps, then the path starts to reveal itself to you step by step. Yes. But yes. it's like, it's like That's the right. Martin Luther King quote, which is, you don't have to see the whole staircase. Take the first step in faith. And that's, that's right. so hard for people. I yes. look back at my career and my entrepreneurial evolution, and it's been a lot of taking very faithful steps. Taking the step, mm -hmm. not seeing the other one out there, and then all of a yep. sudden at the last second, it appears in my foot. Yeah, uh, that's right. firmly on the ground. And some people might go, well, I don't have a family member. My parents don't have money, blah, 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 <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Excuses, excuses. The resources right. are out there. How resourceful right. are you? That's right. That's right. That's right. And also just, and also what I started realizing, just talking about it, just start talking about like being a conversation and say, yeah, you know, I'm, um, I'm starting this or this is what I'm going to be doing. And you just never know who in the conversation or in the room can hear you and, and be like, oh, I heard you was going to do this. I have some interest in it, but I don't have the time, but I have the resources. I have the money that I can give to you or I can, I can invest in it. And so it's, it's, it's endless, but you have to make the decision first. That's the bottom line. Make the decision first and make the first step of faith and don't try to figure out the whole thing. Like, going into the, the acquiring the franchise, like I told Terry uh, some weeks ago that I didn't even, I didn't, I didn't even pull tax documents. And that was one of the important, that's one of the important things you want to do. When yeah, I would not recommend not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that goes to show you how moving, how I was moving through the process. I had PL statements. That's all I had. I had six years of PL state statements. The PL profit and law profit and loss statements. That's right. And we like the business. And how did you learn years? How did you learn how to read a profit and loss statement? Like yeah, I, I didn't know how to read them. Only thing I looked at was the top and the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> so, so so I looked at <laughs> I didn't know. I, I I looked at what it said it brought in, and I looked at what it said it netted, and then I went back up in the middle and found out how much the rent was and divided that up. <laughs> then I went to payroll and said, "Okay, I'm so much to pay payroll." And those that was um. If you go if you go through my notebook of those PL statements, it just have highlighted top bottom, and then I split I for the year I split up I divided up into twelve months. Uh, what the average probably the monthly was. And so that's what I did. And so for me, just doing those parts, it, I was comfortable with doing the purchase because I was I was okay with what the numbers were at that time. So I, I had a friend, her and her husband had already acquired two businesses and they were helping me negotiate. They were helping me talk to the, the seller they even referred to me, referred me to their attorney who does business closings and those type of things. And actually, the seller did the, uh, the, the the contract, our contract, the purchase agreement. The seller did the contract for us, and then I sent the the contract to my attorney, and then my attorney re, re, revised it and sent it back to him. And and then the franchise company also helped us with doing our, our like going over the legal stuff of it like the, the agreement make sure the agreement was good make sure everything was properly you know being transition uh transferred over to our company so i that's how i start i started with you know just going through that this that journey of it in the beginning all the way to the end it was just 
Be because mind you, the not mind you, because because the listeners don't know, but the this happened in May of last year when I went looking. So May of twenty twenty. Yeah, and during 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 the pandemic, and so the brokerage firm that I saw the business listed on 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 its website, and it was on its website. I found it there. I reached out to the broker there. The broker sent me the non-disclosure agreement to sign first before you know he released to me the address and the name of the business. So he sends that to me. And when he sends it to me, I look over it for a couple of days. I send it back. And then I, was, I had another business I was looking into as well. So I was weighing both of them out, you know, like going through the looking through things, trying to really see which one I would, would be best for us. And one of them that I really, really liked, it the, the seller decided to keep it. And then the, the pizza place, it was still on the market. So I said, well, let me don't uh, stop moving slow. Let me go ahead and put some urgency behind it for before this seller, because it's beginning the pandemic. And one of the, the key thing that the other broker said about the one I really liked, that particular business that the owner began uh, uh, decided to keep it. Because of the pandemic, he decided to keep it. Because of his job, his job was going to be changing, so he wanted to keep uh, income. So he said, you know what, I won't sell the business now because my job is changing, so now I need to keep this business in case something happened on the job where I cannot work anymore. Mm -hmm. So that was key for me, and that made me say, oh, that puts a fire under me, so oh, let me call this other broker back before this seller does the same thing. So when I went to call that broker, the number wasn't working anymore. The email I had was coming back as not a working email anymore. So I called the listing website where it was listed at and I called their company office and said, hey, I'm looking for this particular company. You know, I I have, uh, I was working with one of their brokers. She said, well, sir, they called and took all the listings down off our site. That business closed. And that was in May. That brokerage firm. So the brokerage closed. firm representing the seller yes. closed down. Closed down. So now closed you're down. like, oh crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I said, okay. So I said, well, ma'am, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to call the store and ask for the owner. She said, well, sir, I'll be very careful with that because you signed a non disclosure. So you can't tell them what you call them. I said, no, no, I'm not going to tell them. I'm going to tell them I have an important business matter I need to discuss. <laughs> so I called the store and uh, someone answered the phone. I said, hello, I need to speak to the owner. My name is, I gave my name. I said, I have an important business matter I need to talk about. And the, 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 the guy immediately gave me the general manager's number, phone number to call. So I called the general manager. And the general manager was like, give me the runaround. He won't respond back to my call. Then I, I said, you know what? I think this, this is probably a number I can text. So I started texting the number, like texting, like gave him a long text, my name. And I said again in the text, it's an important business matter about your location. And so he ended up responding back some uh, hours later. And then he sent me the owner's email address in that second text. And so when he sent the owner email address, I emailed the owner and I asked the owner, I said, you know, I gave this, this whole introduction to who I am and what I'm reaching out about. And, I, and at the end of that email, I said to him, are you aware that the brokerage firm you hired is no longer in business? He responds back that he's still interested in selling the store and that he had no clue that the brokerage firm was out of business that's crazy. They, they did not even reach out to him to let him know that they're going to be closing their store, I mean, closing their business, and that he should find another brokerage firm to handle this particular sale. So he said, you know what, Dallas? We don't need no broker. We can just handle it ourselves. <laughs> he goes, another thing where you might not want to suggest doing this or doing, you know, doing this route, because uh, remember, I don't know him. He doesn't know me. We just are, we're talking through email, that's all. And that's faith still, because you got, I got to have faith to believe this is the owner. This is not a scam. This is not someone that's pretending or whatever it is. I had to just trust and believe. And so 
uh, the uh, he he we get things going. He had he he has uh, he told his uh, bookkeeper to send me over uh, the six years of PL statements. So I started doing my due diligence, like I said, look at the top and look at the bottom. And then I said, okay, I need to see how has the business been performing four months of the pandemic. So I need to see PL statements as to where I can see how is it performing during this time? Because that was last year. I need to see 2020. So I need to see at least four. I, I, they sent me four four months of it, and so they sent me four months, and it was it was still doing it was doing you know well well enough to what we were comfortable with with purchasing the store still still doing well enough, and so we started doing our doing due diligence work working with our attorney with you know uh, and also we had then when you're buying an existing franchise, you have to get approved through the franchise. So the ones who who's the head, you have to get approved through them to even purchase the store. So even though this, even though the seller is want to sell it, it's of a franchise, but and you got to get approved are, by the landlord. That's right. That's right. And that's going that's going to be another something that's going to be a big <laughs> deal when you get. The, it depends on who you buy, who you're leasing from. Uh, so if it's a big corporation, it's going to be a lot of work. But uh, we got approved. We had to send everything over to them, all your financials, every background, everything that you own, everything that, that that's a part of you or associated with your name, you're going to have to send it to them because you got to show them you have this particular amount of liquid or network uh, worth that, that you can afford to take to afford this business. So we did we did all of that. Uh, my mom and I did all of it together. Uh, Cause she wanted to be a part of the journey as well. She was excited about it, so we did it. We did all the work together. I did most of the work. She just provided documents that I needed, <laughs> but uh, I did most of the work. I did all the work for that part, and then uh, and so we did that. We got approved, and then now it's time to go to training. Well, let me wind back. Now we got to negotiate because we got approved now. So that means we we are moving. So we got to start sending some. We got to send some. Uh, money that's some, some earnest money to be like not earnest money. What's the uh, the money you put down to get yeah, escrow? To just, like the escrow deposit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And I, I heard you say too on the on, on YouTube about you know having like getting one of those yourself and putting the money there yourself. And you know I didn't do that. I went to the bank and got a cashier's check and sent it to the seller. <laughs> so this journey it was all faith. Because I sent it to the sale, I wouldn't get a cash check for that. Which, which I, you know, which I don't recommend. I mean, it worked. It worked out for him, and kudos to taking action. You know, it just shows. Uh, you know, sometimes you can do it ugly. You can do it sloppy. It yeah. doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, when I coach yeah. people, it's all about you know making sure that you're protecting yourself and putting yourself in the mm -hmm. best position possible. And mm -hmm. uh, but either way, either way, it worked out. Lesson learned. Next time, use an escrow yeah. company. <laughs> oh yeah, ne yeah. Next time, I'm going to do that because we're not negotiating. So we end up. Well, we're not negotiating. Well, we we already had negotiated, and that's when I sent the, the money because we had to negotiate, and he didn't want to budge, and I kept having to go back and forth. And this is something key too for us that was key for us is that the brokers was out. So in the asking price had the brokerage fee covered already in it. And so we went and negotiated the brokerage fee back out and just you sell it to us. And, it, and also this was an asset sale. This is an asset sale. So he wasn't selling his business that owned, he was selling the assets of this franchise that we that we purchased. So we negotiated that and what it was worth. I um started to, I had someone go check all the equipment in the store to make sure the equipment was working properly, make sure I wasn't buying anything that was shabby or, or, wasn't, or wasn't working properly, which there was, you know, in the, in the pizza industry or in the restaurant, you have make lines. And one of our make lines was not working properly. And we didn't negotiate this part of what I'm about to share. We didn't negotiate this. I didn't, we didn't sign no contract about this. This was just word to word and just uh, a handshake where he will purchase a new make line for me, a new section of the make line. And let me tell you, he kept his word and he, honored, he, he purchased a new 
part of the make line that where our piece of sauce goes in and the the round our round dough goes under. He purchased that and it wow. came in so uh, like about three weeks, four weeks after we purchased, it came in to our store and the old one that wasn't working properly was out. So it was such a great deal. The deal was so good. And also when I read, I, I gotta say, I can't get this part out. When I read the description of what the store was, which is a carry out and delivery only, it's not designed for dining. It's not even, you don't have a dining room. It just have a straight lobby. You walk to the counter and you walk back out. I thought that was number one, that it would be, it would stand the test of times through this pandemic or through any type of pandemics that may arise and still arise, you know? So that was number one. And location was perfect. It was right at the intersection of a major intersection. It was there. So it was just the perfect opportunity for us to purchase this store. And then we move forward past all of that. We go to training for six weeks and you go, we learn the whole store, learn about how to run the store for six weeks. Now we get to negotiating with the landlord who owns the, the, the uh, shopping plaza. That was a long process because we, <laughs> we finished our training in, in October. We were supposed to close mid-October on the store. But because we didn't have a approval from the landlord, the franchise wasn't going to sign either for us to go ahead and you know, finish everything. You no, know, our part was done with them, but it just, we couldn't like, like, sign an agreement to like transfer everything over and start running the business. If you did, it would have been very risky because the landlord may not approve you and then you'll be operating without a lease. And so, and the thing about this particular lease, this lease was at the end of this term. So it was already, a, it was a five-year lease. It was already at the end. So that means we had to do a whole new lease. And so that was a, a, Long, so we end up not closing. We end up closing on the store, December twenty eighth. Wow! So two months after, more than two months after the original planned closing. Yeah, the original plan. That's right. And we were hit with, I told you thirteen for the security deposit, right? But after I got the hung up, you know, after we we uh, hung up with each other, I uh, went back and looked. It was actually over seventeen thousand dollars. Is what you had to put for the security deposit? Yes, yes. So it was like seventeen thousand two hundred and something. We had so they asked for a security deposit of that amount, and it was because of our the way that our credit history was and our scores. It wasn't what they said would be typically what they would lease to someone, but because they want to keep the store there. And they they love jets being in there in that plaza. They will work with us. And this is a big brand, like a big company that owns this. They have stores. They own they they have stores everywhere, but they some they own the actual property that their stores are in. So this was uh uh it was major. And so we ended up having to go back to the drawing board to negotiate. And 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 so 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 because the money had to come from somewhere, and we didn't yeah. want to want to disturb anything else. So we decided to go back to the table to negotiate with the seller. And the seller at first was very hesitant about doing it. And so we ended up doing a portion of our, our, our asking price as owner finance for 52 weeks. And then the, the major, the, the bulk of it, we gave to him in a cash check. And we didn't also, we didn't want to leave our account in a place where we didn't have enough money to operate. Because remember, I didn't put tax records. So we didn't know exactly what it was going into when we took over the store. So we didn't know if it was going to meet payroll that, that week or if the rent <laughs> will be paid or, or if, you know, remember, these are P&L statements, these profit and loss statements. Sometimes the numbers could be kind of, you know, a little changing a little, a little bit sometimes. And some, not all, but it could be, you know, have a little extra something in there. But uh, we didn't know. <laughs> Uh, we didn't know, so we went and uh, we want to have a cushion. But let me tell you, the deal was so good till we have been in, in this business for eight months, and it has taken care of itself. It has provided for itself. It, I, the third month of owning it, 
I started taking the salary out the third mm. month. Wow. And it's still, and it's still, it still operates, still take care of itself. So uh, since that time, I get paid just like everyone else that worked there. And so, yeah. uh, so it, it has been a, a tremendous blessing uh, for us. And I'm so glad I made the decision to go with it and, and to first ask myself that question, what's stopping me? And to, mm. and, and to answer myself back and say, nothing is stopping you. Go do it. And the rest, as you can hear and have heard, is history. And so now we're on to the races. Uh, we have more that we're working on and 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 just we're just excited. We're just excited. Wow, that's awesome! <laughs> what a, what a story! And there's a lot of uh, little details that we don't have uh, that we don't have time for because we're coming to the end here. Uh, but uh, I, I've heard some of the finer details and points of the story. Yeah. It was like a, a a huge roller coaster and up and down. I mean, yeah. to think to go through that entire process, go to training, and then. You still don't have landlord approval. Then it comes in two yeah. months later. I mean, I, I know having wow. uh, bought and sold locations, wow. I know what that roller coaster is like, and it's not fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, well, it's fun in, in hindsight, <laughs> but it's definitely an, an emotional, yeah. mental roller coaster. So kudos yeah. to you, Dallas, for uh, yes, for, thank you. Thank you. for everything that you've done and what you've gone through. Thank and, you. You know, it sounds like you've learned a lot. Would it, would have advised you to do to do it a little bit differently, but, uh, but, it, but it all worked out in the uh, in yes. the long run. So yeah, yes. thanks for for coming on and sharing your story. Oh yes, it's an honor. It's such an honor. I'm so excited to share my story and my prayers that the listeners would, you know, the ones that are transitioning and are, are on the journey currently, will this would build their faith to make to step out on faith and continue to make step uh, faith steps along the way and uh, don't give up on it. If you want to do it, go for it. You can imagine it. If you can see it, you got to go get it. You got to go get it because it's yours. If you can see it, like my grandma told me, she said, uh, God didn't put it in your mind. I didn't have you to make you think about it because you couldn't get it. He put it there because you, you can get it. and It is yours. So, I want to mm. share the same thing that if you can see that, if it's in your mind, that means you can have it and you need to go get it because it's yours. <laughs> Man, that's a mic, yes, mic yes. drop right there. <laughs> Absolutely. That's awesome. Yes, yes. All right, Dallas, it was a pleasure. Thanks so much for, uh, for coming on and sharing your story, man. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.